fish is today. <laughs> we are so far behind. I am so far behind in all my classes. Um, this is Act 3, Scene 2. We're essentially picking up um, right when the king addresses Hal. <clears throat> and I want to pick up um, around 39. And Henry IV says, <clears throat> Had I so lavish been of my, excuse me, had I so lavish of my presence been, so common hackneyed in the eyes of men, so stale and cheap to vulgar company, opinion that did help me to the crown had still kept loyal to possession and left me in reputeless banishment, a fellow of no remark nor likelihood. So, if I had been in everybody's eyes, if I had been commonly seen, he says, I would still be banished and without any possessions. By being seldom seen, I could not stir, but like a comet, I was wondered at. What does a comet do in the night sky? It flies across it. Okay, it flies across it. What does it do to people who see it? Mesmerizes them. It mesmerizes you. It draws your eye to it. Okay. He's saying, I was like that. Why? Because I was so seldom seen. So when you have a politician, he is suggesting, who is seldom seen versus someone who's always seen, it's the one who is seldom seen that draws the attention. Like a comet, I was wondering that the children would, that men would tell their children, this is he. Others would say, where? Which is Bolingbrook? Why? Because they don't know, even know what he looks like, apparently. And then I stole all courtesy from heaven and dressed myself in such humility that I did pluck allegiance from men's hearts, loud shouts and salutations from their mouths, even in the presence of the crowned king. Notice, back in Richard II, Richard, in one of his more honest moments, says something about Bolingbroke. He says, you know... This guy fancies the commoners, the cart drivers he goes up and talks to, the laborers he bends a knee to. And he suggests in that passage, Richard does, that when Bolingbroke does this, he's being what? Honest. That this is how Bolingbroke really acts, really feels towards the commoners. Now, what does King Henry said, I stole courtesy from heaven. Why? Because it wasn't his natural courtesy. And did what? Dressed myself in such humility. Dressed. He put on humility. There's a big distinction between being humble and acting humble. He's telling us, yeah, it was all an act. It was all an act. Why? To get the people to follow me. To get the people to clamor for me. I mean, you could read this and Richard II. In fact, you could read all four of these, if you want, as a manual for politicians. Or, as it would have been called in Shakespeare's day, there's an actual book called The Mirror for Magistrates. Okay. Kind of modeled off an earlier book written by a very famous Italian. You're all familiar with the book titled The Prince, written by Machiavelli. Okay. I mean, we don't call people Machiavellian without reason. He is very Machiavellian. He is doing what with the people's Emotions, desires, manipulating them. He's manipulating them. That's what politicians have to do. 
Boy, I'm jaded. <laughs> so he goes on. Until he did what? Plucked allegiance from men's hearts. Loud shouts and salutations from their mouths, even in the presence of the king. Thus did I keep my person fresh and new. My presence like a robe pontifical, like the Pope's clothing. Ne'er seen, but wondered. Because he wasn't in the common eye, people did what? They talked about him. They wondered about him. They speculated about him. And so my state, seldom but sumptuous, showed like a feast and wrote one by rareness such solemnity. The solemnity that he's talking about? His kingly garb. Okay? It's one meaning of it at least. Your gloss tells you, lines 57, 59, and so, da, 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 solemnity. And so magnificence on public occasions, infrequent, but always sumptuous, looked festive and achieved by this rarity a suitable formal impressiveness. All right. The skipping king, Richard II, the skipping king, he ambled up and down with shallow gestures and rash bathing wits, soon kindled, soon burnt. Put that in modern English. The skipping king, let's go back a few presidents so we don't pick on any you know, current or the immediate predecessor. Like Clinton going on the old Arsenio Hall show and playing his saxophone and talking about whether or not he wore boxers or briefs. To do what? To ingratiate himself with people, the masses. The mass, but which masses? Those in their 50s, 60s, and 70s? No, the, who are the greatest voters? No, the, the millennials, people. before they were millennials, okay? What else? He carded his state, okay? That is, debased his loyal, excuse me, his royal dignity. Mingled his royalty with capering fools, had his great name profaned with their scorns, and gave his countenance against his name to laugh at jibing boys and stand the push of every beardless vain comparative. He grew common to the streets. I mean, there were times, okay, I'm going to pick on Obama, when you couldn't turn on the TV and not see Obama somewhere. That's what he's getting at. Richard was everywhere seemingly, always seen. Grew a companion to the common streets and fiefed himself to popularity. That being daily swallowed by men's eyes, they surfeited with honey and began to loathe the taste of sweetness. Surfeited, overfull, stuffed with honey. That they kind of went... We're full. We're sick of this. Whereof a little more than a little is by much too much. So when he had occasion to be seen, he was but as the cuckoo is in June. What does that mean? Expect him. That's when you expect to see the cuckoo. In June. Henry is saying, no, no. I'm like, in case you saw the little thing on the Weather Channel, I'm like that very rare yellow cardinal that was spotted in Alabama. Hardly ever seen. Heard, not regarded, seen, but with such eyes as sick and blunted with community, afford no extraordinary gaze. What's he getting at? What's the whole purpose of this long speech? His son is acting more like Richard. People are tired of seeing you coming out of the taverns and whorehouses, Hal. They're tired of seeing you with that fat slob, John Falstaff. All right? And in that very line, line 85, Harry standest thou. 
for thou hast lost thy princely privilege with vile participation. He means participation with vile people. Bardolph, Peto, Pwans, Ned, Falstaff, Mistress Quickly. Not an eye, but is a weary of thy common sight, save mine. Why is Henry's eye not a weary of Hal's common sight? Never sees them. Because he never sees them. Everybody else sees you. The tabloids see you. Why does he never see him? Because Hal's never there when his council meets. And Hal should be. Why? He's the Prince of Wales. He's next in line. Which now doth I, which now doth that I would not have it do, make blind itself with foolish tenderness. How? I shall hereafter, my thrice gracious Lord, be more myself. What does he mean? Be more myself. How can you not be yourself? Is he talking about, you know, am I pretending to be somebody else? Yes. <laughs> when he's with Falstaff and the others, he's not being himself. That's why he said, back there at the end of... Act 1, scene 2. I know you all, and will while uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness. Yet herein will I imitate the sun, who doth permit these base contagious clouds. Falstaff is a base contagious cloud. Bardolph is, Peto is, Pwans is, Mistress, everybody's hanging out with. He is saying, you are a vile, base, lowly thing. And I am like the sun, and I'm letting you for a little while cloud me over. So that when I want to, I will dispel these clouds and people will go, oh, the glory of the Lord has shone upon us, as it were. The king, 93, for all the world as thou art to this hour was richer than when I from France set foot at Ravensburg. That's a threat. That's a warning. <coughs> You stand on the knife's edge, Hal. Why? Because to everybody out there, young Harry Percy Hotspur is like I was then. They're expecting nothing from you, and they're looking to him. Notice what else he's saying. If you, Hal, are like Richard II, and Hotspur is like I was what is Henry foreboding? You won't be king. <laughs> you won't be king. Not only that, but I won't stay king. In other words, um, son, I need you to shore up my right flank. Okay? Now by my scepter and my soul to boot, he hath more worthy interest to the state than thou, the shadow of succession. He's got a better claim, the king says. For of no right nor color like to right, he doth fill fields with harness in the realm. Turns head against the lion's armored jaws. That's the king. He turns heads, the common people, against me, Henry is saying. And being no more in debt to years than thou, leads ancient lords and reverend bishops on to bloody battles and to bruising arms. Just like Henry did. Okay. So, skipping a bunch. Go down to 122. Why, Harry, do I tell thee of my foes? Which art my nearest and dearest enemy? What's the witch? Harry! How? My first eldest son, you are my nearest and dearest enemy. Thou that art like enough through vassal fear, base inclination, and the start of spleen, 
to fight against me under Percy's pay, to dog his heels and curtsy at his friends to show how much thou art degenerate. He's got to say, you know, I, I can see you actually working for Hotspur. I could see Hotspur using you to overthrow me. Do not think so. Finally, Hal really speaks up. And he gets one of his great speeches here. Do not think so. You shall not find it so. Notice the implication there. Think all thoughts, all theory. You shall not find it. Praxis. In reality. And God forgive them that, have, that so much have swayed your majesty's good thoughts away from me. Notice. God forgive them, those people who have turned you against me. Well, who are those people really? Is it Hotspur? Has Hotspur been bad-mouthing Hal? Not really. Northumberland? Nope. John Lancaster? Next in line after Hal? Nope. It's Hal. It's his deeds that have turned the king's thoughts against him. I will redeem all this on Percy's head. That's a polite way of saying, I'll bring you Percy's head on a platter. I will prove to you, Hotspur is not so hot. Be bold to tell you that I am your son when I will wear a garment all of blood and stain my favors in a bloody mask, which washed away, all that stain, all that mask washed away, what? shall scour my shame with it. He is going to be washed clean in the blood of Hotspur. Nice biblical imagery there. And that shall be the day whenever it lights, that is whenever it happens, that this same child of honor and renown, because what did Henry earlier call Hotspur, though Hal's not aware of it because he wasn't there, the theme of honor's tongue. This same child of honor and renown, this gallant Hotspur, and I think he's being somewhat sarcastic. So that if I were directing this, when he says this gallant Hot, that's exactly how he would say it. He's saying Hotspur isn't as gallant as everybody thinks he is. How do I know? Because I'm going to prove it to you. Okay? This gallant Hotspur, this all praise at night, like he can't do anything wrong. And your unthought of Harry, what? Chance to meet. Just give me an opportunity. Let him and me meet open combat. For every honor sitting on his helm, when there were multitudes, and on my head my shames redoubled. For the time will come that I shall make this northern youth exchange his glorious deeds for my indignities. How will he make those two things, those deeds and indignities, exchange? Is he literally going to carry his indignities? Say, Hotspur, you take these and I'll take your glories. No, it's because I'm going to kill him. And if I kill him, what happens? I get all the glory. If someone with my indignities can kill him, then what does that show? I was actually one more deserving of all the honors in the first place. Percy is but my factor. Good. What does he mean by factor? He means this kind of factor. Two multiplied by two. I'm using him for what? And what happens to this too when you multiply this by it? It gets wiped out. Why? Because you end up with something else. Or you can use, you know, the Hegelian version. Thesis, antithesis, 
What happens as a result? Synthesis. But the antithesis is destroyed in the making of the synthesis. All right? So, Percy is but my factor, good my lord, to engross up glorious deeds on my behalf. And I will call him to so strict account that he shall render every glory of, yea, even the slightest worship of his time. Or I will tear the reckoning from his heart. This, in the name of God. Okay, so this is a big oath that he is swearing. I promise here, the which, if he be pleased, I shall perform. Notice, if I don't perform it, then obviously what? God's not pleased to allow this to happen. And if God's not pleased to allow this to happen, then God's not pleased with me, in which case I get what I deserve. That's what I'll say. I do beseech your majesty may salve the long grown wounds of my intemperance. Salve the wounds. He's saying, sorry, dad, I know you have open sores because of my behavior. So, let my future actions do what? Heal those open wounds. A hundred thousand rebels die in this, the king says. In this what? In this civil war, thou shalt have charge and sovereign trust therein. Or excuse me, herein. Okay. The king is saying, all right, Al, I'll take this bet. I believe you. You better succeed. So, Blunt and others come in. And the king says, 170, the Earl of Westmoreland set forth today, with him my son John, Lord, my son, Lord John of Lancaster, for this advertisement is five days old. In other words, this news that we've just received from Blunt, it's five days old. Okay. On Wednesday next, Harry, you shall set forward. On Thursday, we ourselves will march. So notice, Westmoreland is on the march now, along with John of Lancaster. Okay. Next Wednesday, Harry will march. And then the Thursday after that, the king will come. What's he building? Okay, this is a build up of forces. Why have the king come last? The mightiest of them all. Westmoreland, John of Lancaster. John of Lancaster is second in line to the throne. So, mighty force, and then Hal comes. And how, how is Hal going to come? Is he going to come dressed like he's normally dressed when he's at the taverns with Falstaff? No, he's going to come armed cop of pee, head to toe, shining armor, so that people go, wow, I haven't seen him like this before. And Harry, you shall march through Gloucestershire, by which account our business value it some 12 days hence. Our general forces at Bridge North shall meet. Our hands were full of business. Let's away. Okay? So we get a scene with... Falstaff, the prince goes in. I'm going to skip that. Go on to Act 4. Hotspur comes in with Worcester and Douglas. And Hotspur says, Well said, my noble Scott, if speaking truth, this is 4-1. Is speaking truth in this fine age were not thought flattery, such attribution should the Douglas have, as not a soldier of this season stamp should go so general the current throughout the world. Okay. Notice. If speaking truth in this fine age were not thought flattery. What's he saying? It's going to sound like flattery. But I'm, 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 I'm speaking the honest truth here. Okay? What's he saying about the Douglas? Everyone would essentially worship you. Everyone would fall down to you. 
Such attribution, that is such reputation, should the Douglas have, as not a soldier of this season stamp should go so of general current throughout the world. By God, I cannot flatter. That is, I, I don't suck up to people. I don't butter them up. I do defy the tongues of soothers. But a braver place in my heart's love hath no man than yourself. And yet the Douglas is supposed to be what? For Hotspur. Prisoner. He's Hotspur's prisoner. He was supposed to have delivered the Douglas to the king. And now what's he saying? It's like you're my right hand man. You're the one who will stand at my shoulder. Nay, test me to my word. Approve me, Lord. Test me. Thou art the king of honor. So if he's the king of honor, and Hal follows through with his promises, that kingship will what? Fall on Hal's head. No man so potent breathes upon the ground, but I will beard him. That is, I'm ready to defy anyone alive. Plucking the beard, Middle Ages and Renaissance. That was a sign of defiance. And that's essentially what he's saying. There's nobody on the ground that I'm not afraid to go and pluck his beard. Okay? That includes the king, obviously. Okay? Skip a bunch. Um... And we hear Worcester comes in, or a messenger comes in with letters from Northumberland. Actually, we're not going to skip a whole bunch. And Hotspur reads the letter. And Worcester asks, line 21, doth he keep his bed? That is, is Northumberland still in bed? Messenger, yep. Four days ago, when I left, he was. Very sick, much feared by his phys physicians. Worcester, I would the state of time had first been whole ere he by sickness had been visited. That is, I wish we'd been successful before he got sick. Why? What's Worcester afraid of? Okay, what is he, to say he's implying something is too strong, what is he giving an echo of an implication about possibly Northumberland? Maybe this is a advantageous sickness for Northumberland. Meaning, maybe he's not really sick and he just doesn't want to mark it forward with his troops. Maybe he's getting cold feet. Hotspur. Sick? Now? Droop? Now? This sickness does affect the very lifeblood of our enterprise. Notice, Hotspur knows what it means. If we don't have Northumberland behind us, we cannot be successful against the king. Okay? Worcester, your father's sickness is a maim to us, line 42. Hotspur, a perilous gas, gash, a very limb lopped off, and yet in faith it is not. I kind of wonder if the Monty Python writers had Hotspur in mind when they came up the, with the idea of the Black Knight in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Because for Hotspur, an arm missing, just a flesh wound. I mean, a very limb lopped off. And yet in faith it is not. His present what want seems more than we shall find it. Were it good to set the exact wealth of all our states all at one cast? What's he getting at? If we achieve victory without Northumberland, then what does that say about us? We're even greater than we thought. Okay. He goes on and says, you know, this is this is a great opportunity. The Douglas. Okay. Hotspur, 
a rendezvous, a home to fly into, if that the devil and Miss Chancellor Pig upon the maidenhead of our affairs. Worcester, yeah, but I still wish your father was here. We could still use those troops. Okay. Hotspur, you strain too far, line 75. I rather of his absence make this use. It lends a luster and more great opinion, a larger dare to our great enterprise than if the Earl were here. Okay. Douglas, there is not such a word spoke of in Scotland as this ton of fear. In other words, I'm a Scotsman. We don't fear. We'll take whatever. Okay. So Vernon comes in. So we've had Hotspur, Worcester, and Douglas. Messenger comes in. Northumberland's not coming. Worcester's like, eh, maybe we should call off the rebellion. Hotspur, no, we'll, we'll do well. And the Douglas is standing back there going, yeah, we Scots will, you know. So now Vernon comes in. And Vernon says, um, the Earl of Westmoreland, 7,000 strong, is marching hitherwards towards us. With him, Prince John. Like, ooh. Prince John's a teenager. He's young. But it's not the person, Prince John. It is the office that is marching. Okay? Hotspur. No harm. In other words, so? What more? In other words, you, surely you came to tell us more than that. And the king himself in person is set forth. Or hitherwards intended speedily with strong and mighty preparation. Now, that's something. Why? Because Bolingbroke is known as a warrior. He's not like the skipping, ambling king. The poetry king, Richard. Hotspur. He shall be welcome to. In other words, bring him on. What about his son? The nimble-footed madcap Prince of Wales. And his comrades. Who does he mean? Falstaff, Bardolf, Pito, Pwans, and Mistress Quickly. Are they coming? Vernon. Notice Vernon's reply. Because when Hotspur asks his question, he's saying, Oh yeah? What about the Prince of Wales? Ooh, really scary. Listen to... <laughs> if you haven't seen it on Facebook, look for the meme about Hal, the Hal 9000, and Alexa, because it's, it's Siri to a T, okay? So Vernon's reply is deadly serious. What about his son, the Madcap Prince of Wales? All furnished, all in arms, all plumed like estrogens. That with the wind baited like eagles, having lately bathed, glittering in golden coats, like images as full of spirit as the month of May, and gorgeous as the sun at midsummer. Notice, this isn't, yeah, he's coming too. What kind of image is he creating? Majestic. Majestic, like a, like a god swooping down from the heavens. Wanton as youthful goats, wild as young bills, bulls, I saw young Harry with his beaver on, that is, with his helmet on, his cuisses on his thighs, gallantly armed, rise from the ground like feathered mercury, and vaulted with such ease into his seat as if an angel dropped down from the clouds to turn and wind a fiery pegasus in which the world with a noble horsemanship. Okay. You don't easily vault onto a horse wearing a suit of armor. It's, it's not like you just take a run and hop up. Okay. In medieval days, which is what we're talking about, a fully knighted, uh, excuse me, a fully adorned knight in a suit of armor had to be winched up onto his horse. Okay. 
If, if you were in a tournament, for example, in a joust at a tournament, and you get knocked off your horse and you're lying there on the ground, you know how if it was a joust to the death, you know how you died? Because you couldn't get back up. And the other knight rides up alongside you and takes his sword and does this through your neck. Because you're like a turtle on its back when you have 60 or 80 pounds of armor on you and you're just sitting there trying to move. Okay. That's how Vernon has described how. Not on his back, but armed to the teeth. Hotspur. Stop! No more, no more. Worse than the sun in March, this praise doth nourish agues. In other words, come on. We're talking about how here. Let them come. They come like sacrifices in their trim. Sac in their trim. What does that mean? In fine clothing? Adorned for what? The slaughter. And to the fire-eyed maid of smoky roar, all hot and bleeding will we offer them. The male and Mars shall on his altar sit up to the ears in blood. I am on fire. Come, let me taste my horse who is to bear me like a thunderbolt against the bosom of the Prince of Wales. Harry to Harry shall hot horse to horse meet in near part till one drop down a course. Nice little rhyme there. Oh, that Glendower will come. In other words, all we need now is Glendower with all his crazy mad Welshmen. Vernon. Oh, forgot to mention that. Um, Glendower, uh, it's going to be two weeks late. Cannot draw his power this 14 days. Douglas. That's the worst tidings that I have yet. In other words, but I'm not afeard, you know, because I'm a Scotsman and we don't fear anything. Worcester, that bears a frosty sound. Hotspur. Okay, so what may the king's whole battle reach? Um, how many all told will the king have? 30,000. 30,000 men and knights. Hotspur. Let it be 40. How many does Hotspur have? Not close to 30. Okay. My father and Glendower are both being away. The powers of us may serve so great a day. He is the Black Knight. I'll fight him by myself, you know. So, seen with Falstaff and the prince. And the prince comes in and says, about line 40... No, 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 we'll skip that. Um, Westmoreland comes in and gives Falstaff essentially his orders. Okay? And he gives Falstaff a sum of money to do what? Raise his squadron or platoon, if you want. The money is to secure able bodied warriors. Who does Falstaff get? Exact opposite. Non-able bodied or disabled non-warriors. He gets the dregs of society. He gets the homeless. Why? One, he keeps the money. And two, what does he think of them as? 64, 65, 66. When the prince says, I did never see such pitiful Good enough to toss. That is hard. Yeah, good enough to lose. Food for powder, food for powder. Cannon fodder, in other words. They'll fill a pit as well as better. They'll fill a pit of bodies. They'll make as good a carrion pit as will noble born men. And mortal men, mortal men. So what does this tell us about Falstaff's notion of honor? Well, 
book. He's going to put it in words in a few pages. Westmoreland. Aye, but Sir John, methinks they are exceeding poor and bare, too beggarly. Faith for their poverty. Yeah, <laughs> because they are poor. I know not where they had that. That is, I don't know why they're poor. And for their bareness, that is, their lack of clothing, they're not naked, but they're in rags. I'm sure they never learned that of me. Okay. For three. We have Hotspur, Worcester, Douglas, Vernon come in. And then Walter Blunt comes in. And Walter Blunt comes in with an offer from the king. Line 40. Notice Hotspur welcomes Blunt with all appropriate honors, with the appropriate language. Welcome, Sir Walter Blunt, line 34. And would to God you were of our determination. In other words, man, we could really use you on our side of the field. <laughs> Some of us love you well, and even those same and envy your great deservings. And good name, because you are not of our quality, but stand again... And some of us honor you because you're not on our side. He's saying, this is the whole idea of honor among enemies. You can respect your enemy. Blunt. God defend, but still I should stand so, so long as out of limit and true rule, you stand against anointed majesty. Now what should Hotspur interrupt him right there and say? Yeah, don't be talking to me about anointed majesty, you know, because he took the anointing from Richard, but he doesn't. But to my charge, that is, the reason I'm here. The king has sent to know the nature of your griefs, and whereupon you conjure from the breast of civil peace such bold hostility, teaching his duty his land audacious cruelty. If that the king have any way your good deserts forgot, which he confesseth to be manifold, that is, your good deserts are manifold. Those deservings you have are, what's the king doing here? Hotspur, you know, everybody holds you in admiration and great respect. You're a, a mighty warrior. He bids you name your griefs, and with all speed you shall have your desires with interest and pardon absolute for yourself and these here and misled by your suggestion. Give the king your bill of wrongs, the things that have been done against you, the wrongs that you have suffered, and the king will make them right. That's, that's the offer. Right? Now, on the face of it, what kind of offer is this? Okay. It's a, it's a very good one. Give me your list of complaints and I will make them all right. Usually that's not how negotiations work. If you give me your list of complaints, you know, I'll see what I can do. You might get 25% of them. And then you start haggling. <laughs> Notice, and you'll also get pardon. Absolute pardon. Absolute. Full Full pardon, Hotspur, the king is kind. And well, we know the king knows at what time to promise when to pay. In other words, and well, we know the king is a politician. And when he's running for office, he's going to say what? Whatever will happen. Yeah, I'll make all kinds of promises. But once I'm elected, sorry, we don't have enough money in the treasury to do that. My father and my uncle and myself did give him that same royalty he wears. And when he was not six and twenty strong, sick in the world's regard, that is, he was barely even twenty-six when we gave him that crown. Wretched and low, a poor and minded outlaw, sneaking home, my father gave him welcome. He was nothing. He was nobody. And my father welcomed him home and did what? Built him up. And when he heard him swear and vow to God, he came but to be Duke of Lancaster, to sue his livery and beg his peace with tears of innocency, innocency in terms of zeal, 
My father and kind heart pity moved what? Swore him assistance. Performed it too. Now when the lords and barons of the realm perceived Northumberland did lean to him, when all the other barons and peers saw that Northumberland inclined to Bolingbroke and supported Bolingbroke, what did they do? They also gave their support. Notice, why did they give their support? According to Hotspur's telling of the story. Because my father wanted it. Because my daddy did. It wasn't because of Bolingbroke. So who are the lords and peers of the realm really loyal to? Northumberland is what Hotspur is trying to get across. So people met him in boroughs, cities, villages, attended him on bridges, stood in lanes, laid gifts before him, proffered him their oaths, gave him their heirs as pages, followed him even at the heels in golden multitudes. He presently, as greatness knows itself, meaning as greatness becomes aware that it is great. What do presidential candidates start to, how do they start to act as the lesser candidates, let's say in a party primary, start to fall by the wayside? Well, they start to speak a little bit more confidently. You know, when you go, you know, the last time, I think there were what? 21 Republicans running for president, you know, they start dropping off like flies. And you come down to 10 and 8 and 5 and 4, okay? That's what he's getting at. As greatness knows itself, steps me a little higher than his vow made to my father while his blood was poor. While his blood was poor, while he was of no reputation, he said, all I want is my life and my title. That's it. But, now that everybody's bowing down before him, what does he start to think? Well, I could have a little bit more than my lands and my title. I could have it all. Some certain edicts and some straight decrees that lie to, uh, he takes on him to reform some certain edicts, and etc., etc. He cries out upon abuses seems to weep over his country's wrongs. In other words, I am now going to become the savior of my country. I really need to teach this class during a presidential election because this is so ripe. And by this face, this seeming brow of justice, did he win the hearts of all that he did angle for? Angle. What you referring to? Fishing. Fishing. In other words, he did what to the people? He baited them. He threw the bait out there. They bit. And all he had to do was reel them in. He proceeded further, cut me off the heads of all the favorites that the absent king and deputation left behind him here. Badgy. Badget, sorry. Green, etc. Yeah, we talked about it there. What right did Bolingbroke have to execute anyone? He didn't. Okay. But I came not to hear this. Blunt saying, you're, you're talking to deaf ears. Okay, then let me get to the point. After he deposed the king, soon after that, deprived him of his life. Did the king do that? No. And in the neck of that task, the whole estate. To make that worse, he suffered his kinsman March, who is, March is Mortimer, who is what to Hotspur? Brother-in-law. Brother right? Who is, if every owner were well placed, indeed his king, to be engaged in Wales. That is, he allowed his kinsman, Mortimer, to be engaged in Wales. What's he implying? Why? So that he would be captured. Right. There, without ransom, to lie forfeited. So this is the answer you want me to give to the king? Hotspur. No, no, no. We'll withdraw. You go back to the king. 
He says, let there be some surety for a safe return again. In the morning, early shall my uncle bring him our purposes. I would you would. I wish, I desire, I want that you would accept of grace and love. Okay. So, um, skip 4-4, four, four, look at 5-1. So we have Worcester. Actually, no, don't skip 4-4. Four, four. Um, yeah, look at 5-1. Worcester and Vernon come in. And the king addresses them. And he says, line 11, you have deceived our trust and made us doff our easy robes of peace to crush our old limbs in ungentle steel. Old limbs. How much time has passed between this plague and the previous plague? Makes it sound like years. But it wasn't years. Because the previous plague ended, well, let's get ready to go to Jerusalem. Why? So I can make amends for Henry's death, uh, Richard's death. This play opens. Let's get ready. Let's, let's create our army. And what happens? Um, the barons are in rebellion against you. Didn't it say Henry was 26 when he took the throne? That's what Hotspur said. Just so, a few pages ago. Yeah. That timing isn't working in my head. No, it's how, not, is it? Because how is... 18, 19? Yeah, so he was born when Henry was Henry's a stud, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that's part of the problem. Shakespeare's plays aren't okay. meant to be read historically, okay? Because he plays with time and sometimes, you know, doesn't work out quite well. Fathers are six years older than him. Yeah. yeah. So, notice what the king says. To crush your old limbs on a gentle steel, this is not well, my lord, this is not well. What say you to it? In other words, you too are the cause of this. Notice who he's not blaming. He's not blaming Hotspur. He's blaming Worcester and Vernon. Will you again unknit this churlish knot of all of horrid war and move in that obedient orb again, orb, that circle, right? where you did give a fair and natural light and be no more and exhaled meteor. How did they give a fair and natural light? This is the Ptolemaic conception of the universe, you know, with Earth as the center, surrounded by the nine concentric spheres, etc. Okay? But Shakespeare loves this imagery also, because what else does it imply? Each of these spheres is guided by some kind of intelligence. In the Middle Ages, it was an angel. Not an angel, an angel, okay? But Shakespeare loves this imagery, why? Well, because if you think of the sun and the things that orbit around the sun, where do they get their light from? The sun, right? It's reflected light. That's why Hamlet is going to say, you know, that he is too much in the sun. Meaning, he's too much in the king's presence. The king is saying here, I wish that you would move in that obedient orb again. That is, that you would revolve around me. Where you did give a fair and natural light, reflecting the glory of the king. Rather than like a meteor. Because what happens to every meteor? Psst, it burns out, right? He's warning them. Guys, you're going to... Really soon. Hear me, my leash. Worcester. I, I could be well content to entertain the lag end of my life with quiet hours. I'd be really happy to go sit at home and enjoy my last days. That's what he means. I'd like to live a ripe old age in what? Peace. For I protest, I have not sought the day of this dislike. In other words, not my fault. You, 
You haven't sought it? Then why are we here? You haven't sought what's happening right now. Then why are we here? Literally. Because what is the here? This is a field of battle. The battle just hasn't occurred yet. Okay? False death. Rebellion lay in his way and he found it. Notice. False staff, thinking he's smart, trying to be funny, says, well, he just was walking along the road one day and there, there lay rebellion. He just picked it up. Okay? Prince, peace. Worcester. It pleased your majesty to turn your looks of favor from myself and all our house. In other words, you no longer what? Shone upon us. You turned your face away from us. And yet I must remember, that is, remind you, my lord, we were the first and dearest of your friends. For you, my staff of office, did I break in Richard's time and post a day and night to meet you on the way and kiss your hand, when yet you were in place and in account nothing so strong and fortunate as I. That is, not so long ago you were like I am right now. It was myself, my brother, his son, my brother, Northumberland, his son, Harry Percy, that brought you home and boldly did out there the dangers of the time, and you swore to us. What did you swear? You swore an oath at Doncaster, but you did nothing purpose against the state. No claim further than your new fallen right, the seat of God, Duke of Lancaster. That's what you swore. And to this, we swore our aid. And then what did you do, he goes on to say. You took that little inch of ground, made it into a mile. What with our help, what with the absent king, line 49, what with the injuries of a lot of time, the seeming sufferances that you had borne, what were the seeming sufferances? Oh, loss of name, loss of title, loss of lands, loss of wealth, loss of everything. That's not seeming. Those are real losses. In the contrary winds that held the king so long in his unlucky Irish wars that all in England did repute him. Now that's something we haven't heard before, right? I don't remember anywhere in Richard II where it's implied, oh, Richard's dead. All hail the king. <laughs> Bolingbroke. And from this swarm of fair advantages, you took occasion to be quickly wooed, to grip the general sway into your hand. You forgot your oath to us at Doncaster, and being fed by us, you what? You did oppress our nest, grew by our feeding to so great a bulk that even our love durst not come near your sight for fear of swallowing. You became voracious. King, 72. These things indeed you have articulate, proclaimed at market crosses, read in churches, to face the garment of rebellion with some fine color that may please the eye of fickle changelings and poor discontents, which gape and rub the elbow at the news of hurly-burly innovation. He is saying, who is following Worcester, Vernon, Northumberland, Hotspur, Glendower, Mortimer. The people who gape and rub the elbow at the news of hurly-burly innovation. Those who always are what? Dissatisfied with the status quo. Today we would call them the resistance. Antifa, if you want. Okay. Who just... Seemingly, constantly want what? Turmoil. And never yet did insurrection want such watercolors to impaint his cause, nor moody beggars. So the prince speaks up. It says, you know, there's a lot of people that are going to die here. Many a soul that shall pay full dearly for this encounter. Tell you what, tell your nephew that the Prince of Wales does join with all the world in praise of Henry Percy. By my hopes, line 87, 
This present enterprise set off his head. I do not think a braver gentleman. Look at it, the gloss for line 88. This present rebellion is taken from his account, not held against him. By my hopes, Hal is saying, I hope we don't blame this on Hotspur. There is not a more active, valiant, or more valiant, young, more daring, or more bold is now alive to grace this latter age with noble deeds. What's Hal doing? Even though Hotspur isn't physically there. Praising him. Praising him. Flattery? Yeah, a little bit. For my part, I may speak it to my shame. I have a truant been to chivalry. Truant. Late. I've been late to chivalry. I haven't been acting the way I should. And so I hear he doth account me too. That is, and I hear he also thinks I've been truant. Hotspur's not been true to chivalry, right? It, it's the very word out of his mouth all the time. Honor, glory, martial valor, etc. Okay? He lives for it. He breathes it. He eats and drinks it. Okay? Hal saying, me? I drink sack and I sleep with winches at the whorehouse. I've not been paying much attention to it. And I've heard that's what Hotspur also thinks of me. So, he says, yet this before my father's majesty, colon, what's the this? It, it's what comes after. I'll make a wager. I am content that he shall take the odds of his great name and estimation and will, to save the blood on either side, try fortune with him in a single fight. Two champions. I will be the champion for the king and the king's cause. Hotspur shall be the champion for the rebellion and the rebellion's cause. Whoever wins, that side wins. Hotspur wins, the king loses. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of imagine Henry sitting there, because he's listening to all this, and he's going, uh, how? Ixnay on the ingo saying, I'm back, K, you know. No, 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 no. I know you're good with the women and the ladies, you know, and fat old men, but I don't know if I want you out there fighting a Navy SEAL, because that's essentially what Hotspur is. And the king, however, says, and Prince of Wales, so dare we venture thee. That is, go for it. Albeit considerations infinite do make against it. No, Worcester. We love our people well, even those we love that are misled upon your cousin's part. That is, those who follow you. We love them too, even though they are misled. He's saying what about them? They just don't know any better. And will, that is desire, that they take the offer of our grace, both he and they and you. Here's the offer of our grace. Every man shall be my friend again, and I'll be his. So tell your cousin, bring me word what he will do. But if he will not yield, rebuke and dread correction, wait on us. That is, he's kind of like saying, rebuke is on this shoulder, and dread correction is on this shoulder, and I will come into the battle and give you hell. So be gone. We will not now be troubled with reply. We offer fair, take it, advisedly. That is, don't come back with more words. It's a simple yes or no. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, Worcester and Vernon leave, and the prince says, they won't accept it. King, yeah, we'll see. So, the prince leaves, and the king leaves, and we get Falstaff all alone on the stage. He gets a soliloquy. He tells us what he really thinks. And he says, What need I be so forward with him that calls not on me? That is, they haven't said false stuff. Come on. Come with us. It does no matter. Honor pricks me on. Honor spurs me forward. Hmm. 
But how if honor pricked me off when I come on? That is, what if I go with them and honor prick, like in the point of a sword, me off? It kills me. How then? Can honor set to a leg? No. Or an arm? No. Take away the grief of a wound? Now notice the question he's asking. Can honor heal a missing arm? Nope. Does it make you feel better to go, yeah, lost this in war. Honor when you can't feed yourself? No. Honor has no skill in surgery then. No. So what is honor? A word. Well, what's in that word? Honor. What is that honor? Air. Why? Because a word is what? Air breathed out. It's all it is. With form to the sound, and we ascribe meaning to that. So he says it's air. Pfft, a trim reckoning. Trim reckoning. We have already talked about what the word trim means. Adornment. Decoration. Okay, so what kind of reckoning is with that word honor? What kind of adornment does that have? He's saying, there's not much to that word. Who hath it? Who hath honor? He that died a Wednesday. Doth he feel it? That is, do the dead feel honor? No. Doth he hear it? No. Tis insensible then. Notice Shakespeare's pun on words. The dead don't hear it or feel it, right? They are insensible to it, or it is insensible. It cannot be sensed to them. But what else does he mean by insensible? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. It goes against this kind of sense, not just this kind and this kind. Yea, to the dead, but will it not live with the living? That is, won't honor live with the living? No. Why? Detraction will not suffer it. That is, you can't take away from it. Therefore, I'll none of it. Honor is a mere scutcheon. What is a scutcheon? I'm not wearing anything with one. Uh, it says here, it says some sort of emblem and funerals. It's an emblem. It's not necessarily just a funerals. Can you actually say that? Heraldic emblem carried in funerals, displayed on coaches, etc. The lowest form of symbol, having no pennon or other insignia. Just do it. It's like the Nike symbol. Okay. What's he saying about honor? It is a mere draping on, a mere addition to, but it has no real nature to it. Okay? So, 5-2. Worcester and Vernon go back and notice, before Hotspur and Douglas come in, what do Worcester and Vernon decide? They don't tell Hotspur about the king's offer. Why? Because he'll take it. He'll take it. Why will he take it? Because it's an honorable offer. Okay. Line 716. My nephew's trespass may be well forgot, Worcester says. It hath the excuse of youth and heat of blood. Well, he's young and hot-headed. And an adopted name of privilege, a harebrained hotspur governed by a spleen. All his offenses live upon my head and on his father's. In other words, Worcester is saying, they'll forgive Hotspur. They won't forgive me or Northumberland. We did train him on, train like we raised him up for this. We put him up to this. They talked about King Henry angling. Well, they angled too. And his corruption be obtained from us. We as the spring of all shall pay for all. Therefore, good cousin, don't tell him. Okay? 
So, what do they tell Hotspur? Yeah, we saw the prints. Um, and Hotspur asks, tell me, how showed his tasking? Seemed it in contempt? Vernon, no, by my soul. By my soul. I swear by my soul. That's a pretty serious oath if you believe in the soul and either eternal punishment or damnation. I never in my life did hear a challenge urged more modestly. Unless a brother should a brother dare to gentle exercise and proof of arms. He gave you all the duties of a man, trimmed up your praises with a princely tongue, spoke your deservings like a chronicle, making you ever better than his praise by, dis by still dispraising praise valued with you. And which became him like a prince indeed, he made a blushing sidel of himself. That is, he admitted his own faults, but did it in the context of praising your own worthiness. And chid his truant youth with such a grace as if he mastered there a double spirit of teaching and of learning instantly. There did he pause. But let me tell the world, if he outlived the envy of this day, England did never owe so sweet a hope so much misconstrued in his wantonness. Now, you could almost have Hal stand way over here on the corner of the stage and go, ha! Told you. That whole, I know you all speech, you know, worked. Hotspur cousin, I think thou art enamored. In other words, bromance. You love Hal. Never did I hear of any prince so wild liberty. Bring them on, okay? So, 5-3. The battle starts. I'm going to skip a bunch. Hotspur comes in and fights. Douglas kills Blunt. Um, Hotspur leaves, pay line 29. And then comes Falstaff, alone. And Falstaff sees Walter Blunt. Soft, who are you? Sir Walter Blunt. There's honor for you. That's what honor gets you. Dead. Here's no vanity. I am as hot as molten lead and as heavy too. God, keep lead out of me. I need no more weight than mine own bowels. I have led my ragamuffins where they are pepped. He's led his troops. Where? Into the hottest part of the battle. Led them how? As every good general does. From behind. Leading from behind. False step behind. You go ahead. There's not three of my 150 left alive. And they are for the town's end to beg during life. Those three are wounded. Everybody loves Falstaff because he's a funny character. Apparently, Elizabeth I so loved the character of Falstaff from the Henry IV plays that she begged, anecdotally we're told, Shakespeare to write another play that focused on Falstaff. And so Shakespeare wrote The Merry Wives of Windsor which has Falstaff trying to get in and out of the beds of various Merry Wives of Windsor. Okay. Probably choosing Windsor there intentionally, since that is where the castle is. Okay. Is Falstaff really a lovable character, though, when you get to scenes like this? Where he, I mean, he's responsible for the death of these men. And how does it affect them? Yeah, that's war. Okay. So Hal comes in. Hal says, lend me thy sword, because Hal's lost his. And Falstaff pulls something out, and what is it? It's a bottle of sack. Okay. Which should be, he pulls it out of his holster. They had long guns, pistols at this point. Should be in his, pistol should be in his, shoulder, in his holster. He pulls out this bottle of sack, and Hal takes it and throws it. What, is it a time to jest and dally now? Foster, well, a person be alive, I'll pierce him if you do come in my way. You know? Does Hal, excuse me, does Falstaff pierce Percy? 
Yes, he does, but only after he's dead. Okay. So, 5-4. We have the king and Douglas enter, etc., etc. And Hotspur comes in, line 59. And Hosper says, if I mistake not, thou art Harry Monmouth. Thou speakst as if I would deny my name. My name is Harry Percy. Why, then I see a very valiant rebel of that name. I am the Prince of Wales. No, notice, don't call me Harry Monmouth. <laughs> call me by my title. I am the Prince of Wales, and think not Percy to share with me in glory anymore. Two stars. Keep not their motion in one sphere. This idea. Right? No, you can only have one star. Mine. You're going down. Nor can one England brook a double reign of Harry Percy and the Prince of Wales. Nor shall it, Harry, for the hours come to end the one of us. And would to God thy name in arms were now as great as mine. Thy name in arms means what? Reputation. Is reputation reality, however? No. No. See, we see the same thing in Hamlet. End of the play. Hamlet has a fencing match with Laertes. And what does everybody think about Laertes? Oh, he's going to win, hands down. Why? He's young, he's trim, in good shape, and he's a fencing master. Hamlet, we're told, is fat. Okay? Hamlet's also 30. Laertes is younger. Okay? And yet, what do we see? Hamlet wins. Why? Simply because of the poison foils? No. Two times Hamlet gets a touch on Laertes, meaning he's a better swordsman, even though he's fat and old at 30. <laughs> so, they fight. Falstaff comes in and he goes, come on, Hal, you And Hal kills Hotspur. Hotspur. Oh, Harry, thou hast robbed me of my youth. Right? Because <laughs> I mean, he's not going to get any older. And his youth is leaving him for all eternity. I better brook the loss of brittle life than those proud titles thou hast won of me. I would rather die than lose the titles that you're now going to get because of having been my killer. The wound my thoughts worse than thy sword my flesh. But thoughts the slaves of life and lifetimes fool and time that take survey of all the world must have a stop. Thoughts must come to an end. Life must come to an end. Time must come to an end. Oh, I could prophesy but that the earthy and cold hand of death lies on my tongue. No, Percy, thou art dust and food for... And he dies. Okay. Notice what Hotspur doesn't do that Laertes does in Hamlet. You'll see when we get to it. Reconcile. Laertes forgives Hamlet. For his death? Yeah. But what else? For Polonius' death. He says... Let my father's death not be charged to you. If you forgive others their sins, their sins will be forgiven. Okay, Christ says. So the prince fills in Hotspur's dying words. And food for, for worms, brave Percy. Fare thee well, great heart, ill-weaved ambition. How much art thou shrunk? That ambition shrank from what? What was Hotspur thinking? If they deposed the king, who was going to become king after Henry IV? Were they going to put Hal on the throne? No. Was it going to be Northumberland? Probably not because he's old. Worcester? Probably not because he's old. What's Hotspur thinking? Would it not have been warmer? You're Hotspur. You think yeah. you're going to put your brother-in-law on the... No. Ill-weaved ambition. When that this body did contain a spirit, a kingdom, for it was too small a bound. 
But now two paces of the vilest earth is room enough. This earth that bears thee dead bears not alive so stout a gentleman. Stout, strong, worthy. He is saying what about Hotspur? We will not see his like again. He is saying Hotspur is the essence of chivalry, of gentlemanliness. If thou wert sensible of courtesy, I should not make so, so dear a show of zeal, but let my favors hide thy mangled face. Okay? And what does he do? He takes off his plume, scarf, glove, or similar article and lays it over Hotspur's face. His favors means this is kind of like the prince giving Hotspur an honored burial. No, he's not dead. He's not buried yet. But he's laying something of his on him. Okay? And so he leaves. Adieu and take thy praise with thee to heaven. He doesn't say, and may you go to hell where, where rule the prince of rebellions. Which is what he could say, right? No. Thy ignominy sleep with thee in the grave. Thy ignominy, thy lawlessness, your wrongdoing, let that die with you. And all the good you did, what? Rise with you. Okay? And he sees false stuff on the ground. He says, what? Could not all this flesh keep in life a little? And he leaves, and false stuff gets up. And what's he do? Where's dead Percy? But how do I know he's really dead? Let me make sure. And he stabs him in the leg. Okay. And then he tells Hal, I killed him. Hal, 142. I killed Percy myself and saw thee dead. Didst thou? Lord, Lord, how this world is given to life. I was down out of breath, so was he. But we rose, both at an instant, fought a long hour by Shrewsbury clock, if I may be believed. So, if I may be believed, that's how it really happened. Hal's like, whatever. Notice what Hal is not concerned with. Does Hal go around and tell everybody, false staff says he killed Hotspur, but it was really me. I did it. I get the glory. Nope, he doesn't care. Let false staff have it. Why? What is in the word honor or glory? It's a mere escutcheon. Hal's concerned with what? Realities, not reputation. Okay? So, 5-5. Five, five. The king says, Thus ever did rebellion find rebuke. Well, that's an ironic statement. Ill-spirited Worcester, did not we send grace pardon in terms of love to all of you? And wouldst thou turn our, coffer, our offers contrary? Misuse the tenor of thy kinsman's trust? In other words, you didn't tell him. And now three knights upon our party are slain today, a noble earl and many a creature else had been alive this hour, if like a Christian thou hadst truly borne betwixt our armies true intelligence. Blunt would be alive, Hotspur would be alive, a lot of people would be alive. If you had been honest. Worcester. Eh, what I did, my safety. Saving my you-know-what urged me to do. He says, yeah, well, it didn't work. Bear him to his death. And they go in to execute Worcester and Vernon. Okay? So what does the king do? With the enemy soldiers, the rebels, 26, 24, um, the king, the prince said, Brother John of Lancaster, to you this honorable bounty shall belong. Go to the Douglas, deliver him up to his pleasure, ransom listen free. His valor shown upon our crest today have taught us how to cherish such high deeds, even in the bosom of our adversaries. And the king says, all right, this then remains that we divide our power. You, son John, my cousin Westmoreland, you guys go towards York. Why? What's just north of York? West. Nope, that's West. Northumberland. We got to send an army north. Okay. 
time to meet Northumberland and the prelates group. Henry, you and me, Harry, you and me, we're going to go to Wales. Why? To fight with Glendower and the Earl of March. Notice, it's not to fight with Glendower and redeem the Earl of March. He knows. Mortimer is in cahoots. He's in league with Glendower. Rebellion in this land shall lose its way, meeting the check of such another day. And since this business so fair is done, let us not leave till our own be won. Okay, we'll stop there. Henry the Fourth, Part Two, first half or so on Thursday. I will have your exams back for you on Thursday. What does uh, alarm mean? That stage direction.